My family thinks I am somewhat obsessive about all things BYU. For example, I go to sleep every night on a Y logo pillowcase. I head out to my car each morning through a door that's adorned with a very large magnetic Y. I fly a large Y flag on my porch on BYU game days, and in addition, I display numerous BYU-themed posters around our home. These posters generally celebrate historic coaches, events, and athletes, such as BYU's 1984 National Championship in football. Uh, one of my favorites, a 2006 John Beck to Johnny Harling touchdown pass against the University of Utah. <laughs> and of course, a certain BYU Basketball National Player of the Year in 2011, known to those who adored him simply as the Jimmer. I love BYU. It is a spectacular place to study and to work. Like many of you, I have a long and varied and personally rewarding association with BYU. My mother was a freshman at BYU around 1950. At that time, BYU had only a few thousand students and was housed in a small collection of buildings, mostly clustered on the southwest corner of our campus. As you can see, BYU was and continues to be a work in progress. My first recollection of BYU was watching a fast-paced 1966 NIT basketball championship team when I was only 14 years old. And although I am a fifth-generation Mormon and a descendant of 19th-century pioneer stock, I was the first member of my extended family to actually graduate from BYU. I later became a double cougar, also graduating with the third class of BYU's law school. One of my most treasured mementos from the law school is this photograph of Rex Lee. He was the dean, handing me a law degree diploma in 1978. In my view, Rex was the finest lawyer of his generation. As an undergraduate student at BYU, I met my wonderful wife, Dottie, in a family home evening group. We've been happily married for nearly 42 years. All of our four children graduated from BYU and married fellow Cougars. <laughs> we now have 14 grandchildren now all hoping for the day when they get to rise and shout as students at this prestigious university. And to cap it all off, for nearly 30 years, I've had the great privilege of working as an attorney for BYU in the office of the general counsel. Now, some of you may wonder why BYU needs so many highly capable attorneys and support staff. And I can tell you that we live in legally perilous times and that the legal professionals at BYU are working hard and effectively behind the scenes to advance and protect BYU and its standards, values, and assets. I am really proud of all that this great collegial group has accomplished. For me, being employed at any institution of higher education would be a noble calling. Those of us associated with American higher education get to wake up every workday with an extraordinary opportunity to advance the greater good of society. Working together, students, faculty, administration, and staff help prepare the rising generation with the education and the skills they will need to improve the world and to enhance their chances for happy and abundant lives. That said, I believe studying or working at BYU is a singular opportunity. Certainly by any secular standard, BYU is an outstanding, nationally recognized university. However, what makes it unique in all the world and what draws to its special attention and scrutiny is its vitally important mission to help build the kingdom of God. Consider, for example, these sentences from BYU's mission statement, which was approved by church prophets, seers, and revelators in 1981. The mission of Brigham Young University, founded, supported, and guided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is to assist individuals in their quest for perfection and eternal life. And, it continues, we believe the earnest pursuit of the institutional mission can have a strong effect on the course of higher education 
and will greatly enlarge Brigham Young University's influence in a world we wish to improve. Frankly, this is the highest and best mission statement of all the great universities of the world. It isn't just an institutional mission. It is individual and concerns each one of us who are part of this marvelous campus community. But just exactly how will this great mission be achieved? It can only be achieved by the campus community and will take a lot of hard work and time and inspiration. At BYU, we often speak of the combination of study and faith, where secular and spiritual knowledge as the key components to moving forward the mission of BYU. Today, as we are gathered in a devotional setting, I would like to focus on the spiritual dimensions of revelation in BYU's mission fulfillment. In one of his first addresses to the Church in the April 2018 General Conference, President Russell M. Nelson stated, One of the things the Spirit has repeatedly impressed upon my mind since my new calling as President of the Church is how willing the Lord is to reveal His mind and will. The privilege of receiving revelation is one of the greatest gifts of God to His children. We all have a great need throughout our lives to obtain God's guidance as we attempt to navigate the many challenges and questions that come to us. However, in no stage of life is the need for heavenly direction more important than in the formative college and young single adult years, particularly in those first few years spent living away from home and family. Some of the foundational questions which will likely confront a young single adult at this time of life include the following. What are my fundamental standards, values, and beliefs? In short, who am I? What kind of person should I marry and partner with in this life and the next? What exactly will be my life's work, and how will I contribute to make the world a better place? In a very real and profound sense, once these decisions have been made, I can tell you the rest of one's life is something of an epilogue. It is therefore impossible to underestimate the importance of these decisions for our future well-being and happiness. And fortunately, as baptized and confirmed members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have the gift of the Holy Ghost to be our constant companion, to reveal to us the truth of all things. Moreover, God has promised us that He is anxious to help us with the wisdom to address the perplexing issues of our lives if we seek Him out and are willing and worthy to both receive and act upon His guidance. Prophets, both ancient and modern, have shared with us their insights into how this revelatory process may play out in our individual lives. The Old Testament prophet Elijah observed that the voice of the Lord is not in the wind or in the earthquake or in a fire, but rather in a still, small voice. Some revelations are made known to us in sudden moments of inspired insight or perhaps in an unusual and vivid dream. On the other hand, some promptings come more subtly. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught how we can recognize the promptings of the Spirit. Does it persuade one to do good, to rise, to stand tall, to do the right thing, to be kind, to be generous? If you are doing the right thing and if you are living in the right way, you will know in your heart what the Spirit is saying to you. BYU President Kevin J. Worthen has emphasized that inspiring or experiential learning, that is to say literally learning by doing, is an integral part of the BYU experience. One of the most important reasons why we agreed to be sent to this earth was to learn by our own experience how God individually communicates to us. As our Father in Heaven, God knows how best to communicate to each of us individually, one by one. He's also interested and involved in the very details of our lives, right down to the moment-to-moment -moment thoughts and feelings. I want to share with you how I came to understand the truth to this reality when I was an 18-year-old freshman at BYU. During my freshman year at BYU, <clears throat> I resided in room T417 of Deseret Towers. 
This is a picture of me, my back to the camera as usual. A hometown friend and my mom on my first day on campus in 1970. Uh, my dad, who just passed away about a week ago, is taking the picture. Uh, I, DT, as we called it then, is, are the large uh, buildings in the background. And by the way, B, uh, DT no longer exists and has long since been replaced by new and better student on-campus housing. However, my old dorm room and the experiences I had there still exist vividly and affectionately in my mind. My undergraduate days were part of an historical era that is sometimes referred to as the long 60s, the period from the late 1960s to the early 1970s. Uh, parenthetically, they say that in order to remember the 1960s, you have to be at least in your 60s. And I can tell you that that is true in my case. This was a time of brilliant rock and roll music <laughs> and of unwise experimentation by young people with premarital sex and illegal drugs and of extreme student unrest at many colleges and universities across America, mostly in opposition to the war in Vietnam. At the same time, BYU was a hotbed of conservative calm, traditional values, and for me, serious study in the midst of these wrenching cultural changes around the rest of the country. Indeed, as I have grown older and matured somewhat, I have appreciated even more the protected environment at BYU when I was a young and impressionable undergraduate. I predict that many of you students will come to feel the same way after you complete your studies at BYU and make your way in a, to serve in a larger world. Because I had ambitions to be a serious student, and to get good grades, and to qualify for graduate or professional school, I took every class very seriously, including my religion classes. So late one Saturday night in my dorm room on a very quiet fourth floor in T Hall, I found myself alone studying the Book of Mormon. I had a midterm test that included 3rd Nephi coming up on Monday. I was studying with a determined focus and was carefully rereading 3rd Nephi chapter 11. You may recall that this chapter relates the gathering of the more righteous people to the temple in the land of Bountiful in America after the more wicked part of the people had been destroyed in the tempests, earthquakes, fires, whirlwinds, and physical upheaval following the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. As I read verses 7 through 10 about Jesus Christ descending out of heaven and appearing to the gathered multitude, I stopped reading, leaned back in my chair, paused, and wondered to myself something like this. Really? Did a resurrected Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, just miraculously appear out of thin air and descend out of the sky to minister to a group of pre-Columbian Native Americans? Did this really happen? In that moment, I honestly and sincerely wanted to know for myself whether or not these things were true. I was totally sincere, but I did not expect to receive a revelation or an answer from God. Nevertheless, in the next moment, I had a very surprising and life-changing experience. Uh, beginning in my chest, and spreading through my body, I experienced a warm, almost burning sensation, together with a thought or impression that came to my mind, somehow coming from outside of me, confirming this event did, in fact, take place exactly as described in the Book of Mormon. As this palpable sensation passed, my mind rapidly came to a number of profound follow-on conclusions. I had just experienced the promise made by Moroni in chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, that the Holy Ghost would make manifest the truth of the Book of Mormon. I now knew for myself that the Book of Mormon was the Word of God, that Joseph Smith was a prophet through whom God brought forth the Book of Mormon, that the restoration of the gospel had occurred, that I probably had a role to play in the unfolding of that gospel, and most importantly, that Jesus Christ was really alive and His Atonement was real. 
In short, I now saw the world and my place in it in a new and wondrous way. For me, this particular spiritual experience was extraordinary. It was strong, impressive, and quite unexpected. It was also different in kind and degree from the many other and more frequent but less dramatic spiritual experiences that I've had before and after this event. This was more than an inspiration, a thought, or a feeling. It was a physical sensation that was somehow recorded or written in my heart and in my mind in an individual way that made it more permanent and memorable. Over the years, this experience has proven to be something of an anchor to my faith and my trust in God. As we all know, this world we live in has been purposely designed to challenge us in the choices that we make and in the manner in which we react to the inevitable adversity that finds us all. This mortal experience can take a toll on our testimony and commitment to the gospel. It is precisely in these times of testing that we need to be intellectually honest with ourselves and consciously remember the authentic spiritual experiences we have had. This is part of the sacramental promise which we make to always remember Christ. We should remind ourselves that we really have had these experiences, and by so remembering we can be reassured that God is real, that He loves us, that He will keep the promises that He has made with His covenant-keeping people. We can also respond in the affirmative at any time and any place to the provocative question put by Alma to the Nephite people in the Book of Mormon. And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? Heavenly Father is not only interested in our spiritual growth and progress, He also wants us to be happy and successful in achieving the righteous aspirations we have. He knows that it's through small and simple, seemingly simple things that great things are accomplished. Some 17 years after my freshman year at BYU, another miraculous event occurred in my life. I got an offer to come back to work at BYU. I'm going to spare you the 10-year saga of how, with a lot of sacrifice and prayer, this all came about. However, I can assure you that I was absolutely thrilled. Coming from the private practice of law with all of its attendant pressures of running a small business in a small market in Southeast Idaho, I saw BYU as a sort of Garden of Eden for me. In my mind, at BYU, my true interests and abilities would be put to the best possible use. There were, of course, a couple of challenges one of which was to find the right house and the right neighborhood in Provo to raise our young and growing family. When Dottie and I came back to Provo in June of 1988 to do some house hunting, we knew exactly what we were looking for. We wanted an affordable home to accommodate a family of six in a pleasant, leafy neighborhood close to campus, but not too close, and with a good-sized backyard. In addition, we also wanted to have as neighbors other young families stocked with the right age of friends for our children, close to church and good schools. I guess like everyone else looking for a new house, we were looking for affordable perfection. <laughs> After spending two days with a very patient real estate agent, we found some promising neighborhoods, but there were literally zero houses on the market that fit our wants, needs, and pocketbook. We drove the four hours back to Idaho feeling discouraged and resolved that we would find a place to rent and resume our home search after we relocated to Utah. That very night back in Idaho, I had an unusual dream. It was in bright, natural colors with very precise details. In my dream, I was walking along a paved path which ran alongside a picturesque small river. The river was running fast and was lined by big green trees. It was a perfect sunny day in June a lot like today. As I enjoyed this calm and peaceful scene, I noticed that it appeared to be slightly snowing. This was strange, but added to the charm of this beautiful landscape. Big white flakes were drifting down out of the sky in the middle of summer. When I woke from this dream, I didn't know its meaning, 
but I had a reassuring feeling that things were going to work out just fine for me and my family with our move to BYU. Well, we did find a temporary rental and we lived there for about 15 months while we looked high and low from Alpine to Mapleton for the right house. We never found it. Instead, we came across an undeveloped lot in a small secluded neighborhood in North Provo, located about one mile from the mouth of Provo Canyon and three miles from BYU. The neighborhood was bordered on the west by the Provo River, and interestingly, on the east boundary was a paved bike path running up the canyon to Vivian Park. We ultimately bought the lot, built a house on it, and started our new lives in the Northgate neighborhood. Several years later, as I was walking along the path near the river in the month of June, I had a feeling of incredible deja vu come over me. There was a small squall of white cottonwood seeds that were gently falling off the trees, lining the river and collecting on the path. This seemed to be snowing in summer, just as I had dreamed back in Idaho. It has now been several decades since, long, since that long ago dream and dream fulfillment. Our home and neighborhood turned out to be exactly the right place to raise our family. We have lived by wonderful friends. And in fact, it's been nearly perfect, much better than we could have imagined in our house hunting days. All of this came back to me when President Nelson made the following comments about Revelation in his April 2018 General Conference address. To be sure, there may be times when you feel as though the heavens are closed, but I promise that as you continue to be obedient, expressing gratitude for every blessing the Lord gives you, and as you patiently honor the Lord's timetable, you will be given the knowledge and the understanding you seek. Every blessing the Lord has for you even miracles will follow. That is what personal revelation will do for you. It is reassuring to hear the words of a modern-day prophet that the Lord continues to be anxious to guide and direct His children in their individual circumstances. President Nelson did note, however, that there may be times when we might feel like the heavens are closed. In addition, the Lord sometimes has a timetable and a plan for us that we can understand only in the process of patiently waiting upon the Lord. We need to do our part by being obedient to the commandments, gathering reliable information, and often coming to the Lord with a thoughtful, well-informed plan of our own. While we can be assured that the earnest prayers of our heart are being heard and will be answered, the manner in which they are answered and the timing of when they are answered are in God's hands. In my experience, the gifts of the Spirit are always forthcoming promptly and clearly when we seek discernment regarding fundamental matters involving right versus wrong, in choosing between good and evil, and truth versus error. The Spirit will enlighten us particularly through the listening to the prophets as to where to stand in our age of a dramatic and ever-accelerating gulf that's happening throughout the world between the children of light and the children of darkness. That noted, we must also acknowledge that the Spirit does not come at our command. So what should we do in those circumstances when the revelation we so earnestly desire just doesn't seem to be coming? There may be times and important decisions when the Lord will expect us to act without explicit direction by using our best informed judgment and agency wisely. If we are keeping the commandments and really seeking the Lord's will, and not our own purely personal agenda, these decisions and actions tend to turn out for our good and are often ratified by the Lord. Understanding the nuances of how we communi communicate with God through the Holy Ghost is a lifetime challenge. However, given the spiritually dangerous times in which we live, there is no more important task at hand for us individually and as a people. By any measurement, I am in the twilight of my career at BYU. I have experienced and loved the spirit of the Y. I've also seen in a number of ways and at several levels the hand of heaven moving in often unexpected ways to protect and preserve the mission of BYU, even after all we at BYU could do. 
BYU is an important part of the restoration and will continue to play a vitally important role in the building up of the kingdom of God. I testify it is a shining city on a hill and it must be protected and preserved. The divine destiny of BYU will continue to be fulfilled as we, the campus community in Christ, listen to and act upon the spiritual impressions that come to us in these latter days. Of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.